Okay, welcome to our discussion about dealing with reversible reactions in the synthetic organic chemistry lab. So now that we're past our technique laboratories, uh, we're interested in actually designing some syntheses which will yield us relatively high amounts of product using the simplest available reactions. Now the problem with using the simplest available reactions often is that they're reversible which means that uh, they're uh, potentially endergonic, and a lot of them actually are. That means they don't favor products, they favor starting materials. And yet, they're very frequently used in organic synthesis. So the question I'm posing here, you already know the answer to. Uh, the question is, can a disfavored equilibrium be used effectively in organic synthesis? And the answer is yes, as long as we thoughtfully design and run our synthesis. So let's consider a simple one-to-one -one reversible reaction. And we'll make this as simple as possible by making its equilibrium constant 1. So in this case, I've got two reagents reacting to form two materials. Let's say that the orange will represent the less expensive reagent, the green and gray complex the more expensive reagent, and then we'll have the green uh, square representing our byproduct and the desired product represented by the orange and gray complex. Now this may seem like an oversimplification, but in fact this is an exact duplicate of one of the reactions with which we're going to be working, and that is the Fischer esterification, shown here as the esterification of methanol with benzoic acid to form water and methyl benzoate. This is the same stoichiometry and similar reversibility with equilibrium constants somewhere around one, or at least on that order of magnitude. So let's, before we get into any specific reactions, let's just consider our generic reaction and think about how this is going to behave uh, if we simply mixed reagents and let nature take its course. If we were to mix equimolar amounts of both starting materials, as we've done in the bottom left of this slide, we're going to have a problem here, and that is that based upon the equilibrium constant that I gave you, the reaction stoichiometry and starting concentrations, I know that the best yield I can anticipate would be 50%. Now, how do I know this? Well, I know this because I applied my general chemistry principles to this reaction and put together a rice table. With the initial concentrations of both starting materials, for example, equal at one molar. Now again, with the rice table, we always sort of hold time back and, and don't let anything react at first, which means the initial concentrations of both of my products will be zero. Because of the stoichiometry of the reaction, the changes will be, will be simple. It'll simply be negative x for starting materials, positive x for our products. And from these, we can calculate the equilibrium concentrations in terms of that change x. Finally, I can use my reaction uh, equilibrium constant and those values of the equilibrium concentrations to solve for x and in doing so, I discover that x is about 0.5, meaning that once this equilibrium begins and establishes itself, as you can see in the left-hand pane, there is never a time when more than about half of my material is actually complex in the way that I would like it. So were I to simply mix these and then try to retrieve my product, I would be setting myself up for, at best, a 50% yield for my reaction. But we can do better than this. The first strategy for dealing with reversibility like this is to increase one of the reactant's concentrations. In this case, recall that we defined the orange uh, squares as being the less expensive or more available reagent. So in an effort to maximize conversion of the more expensive reagent, I'm going to triple the concentration of my less expensive starting material. When I do this and compute the same equilibrium using my rice table, what I discover is that I have changed the initial concentration of one reagent by a factor of three. Carrying this through the rice table leads me to an equilibrium constant expression, which allows me to calculate for that change once again. But what I find now is that because I have that three molar starting material, the value of x has changed to 0.75, meaning that by tripling the concentration of my less expensive starting material, I've increased the conversion of my more expensive starting material by a factor of about 50%. So if I were to allow this reaction to establish equilibrium, I could expect that about 75% of the product that I would like would be collected. Now if we take this to the extremes using a one reagent, for example, as a solvent, these initial concentrations can become very, very high. 
And in fact, we can get nearly quantitative yields. This is one way to cope with using a reversible reaction in a synthesis which we would like to have run to completion. As an example, let's consider running our hypothetical reaction under a few different sets of conditions. The first of these conditions is going to be using an inert solvent, which will be represented in this example by blue spheres. If we add equal amounts of both our starting materials to this mixture, Based upon our equilibrium calculations, we expect that when the reaction is complete, at best, 50% of our product will be converted. But let's think about changing the conditions so that we use one of our starting materials instead as the solvent. When we instead switch to one of our solvents as starting materials, we've changed the condition in order to exploit Le Chatelier's principle. Again, remember, this solvent concentration is now extremely high because we're dealing with a molecule or a compound's concentration in itself. Adding our starting material to this, we can expect that a very high percentage of that starting material will be converted to product, and the small amount of byproduct which forms will then be diluted into the new solvent, and therefore the reverse process is very unlikely to occur. In fact, we can exploit this reaction and this, tr this strategy in another way as well, by reversing the reaction. If it were our desire to instead convert this product into a starting material, we could simply alter the conditions, removing the original solvent and replacing it with the byproduct as solvent. Using this as a solvent, we can expect that addition of the what was once the product is now a new starting material, and the reverse process can be uh, set up so that it's favored. So in this way, reversible reactions are not only uh, useful, but in some ways they offer us advantages over irreversible reactions, because we can choose the directionality based upon the setup of the reaction. So to summarize the first strategy we have for dealing with a reversible reaction with an equilibrium constant near 1, uh, solvent choice can have a profound effect on which product we form and in what amounts. So we have three possible situations here. We have an inert solvent, we have using one of the reagents as solvent, and then we also have using the byproduct as solvent. In the first case, when we use an inert solvent and equimolar amounts of reagent, we anticipate to have approximately an equal mixture of all components. When, however, we switch to using the reagent as solvent, there's a dramatic shift in equilibrium, which manifests itself as a very high yield of the desired product. If we instead use the byproduct of solvent, we're able to reverse the preference of the reaction and actually drive it backwards so that what was originally considered the starting material is in fact the product of the reaction. So in this case, we can make large amounts of the material, which in our case was stone as a starting material. Now let's consider an alternate method of driving our reaction toward product. And that would be to, again, apply Le Chatelier's principle, but to do so instead by removing product as it forms, instead of increasing the concentration of the starting materials. So let's take a look again at our equilibrium with equimolar amounts of both starting materials. If I allow equilibrium to first establish itself, my rice table predicts that 50% of my desired product will be formed. And this would be the maximum if we simply allow this equilibrium to remain in place. But what if I could somehow introduce a second portion of the system which was disconnected from the remainder of the equilibrium and then transfer my product into that region? If I do so, looking back at the original material, I now have a situation where a new equilibrium could be established and the concentrations have changed. You'll notice now that we have one half molar of each starting material and also one half molar byproduct. Placing these into the rice table and running a new calculation tells me that I should recover about 33% in the new equilibrium. That is 33% of the remaining material, which could be converted. If I can then remove that material again, placing it in a separate container away from the equilibrium, a new set of conditions will form. And under these new concentrations, I again calculate that about 25% of my remaining starting material can be converted. I'll remove that and continue the process until I've removed essentially all of the material that I can possibly get from the reaction. 
if I do this carefully enough, I can achieve what is essentially a quantitative conversion of my starting material to product. So now that we've established that it is indeed possible to use a disfavored equilibrium during a synthesis, let's take a look at a slightly more specific example of how we can accomplish this. I've given you again our generic reaction, but I'm going to put one more condition on the reagents and the products that we see, and that is, let's assume that our product of interest has the lowest boiling point. In other words, it's the most volatile component of an equilibrium mixture. This would be a very fortunate situation for us because we know how to remove the most volatile component of any chemical mixture. That would be by distillation. So in this case, what I've done is charged the boiling flask of a simple still with the reagents for our synthesis. And as we begin to run the synthesis, what we'll see is that as that new material forms, it preferentially vaporizes and then accumulates in the receiving flask. So what we're going to see here is that when the desired product is the most volatile component in the reaction mixture, distillation is an excellent way to exploit Le Chatelier's principle and maximize conversion. So let's start our reaction now. Notice that one set of molecules has already reacted to form the product and byproduct. And the highly volatile product will then vaporize, reach the condenser, and ultimately accumulate in the collecting flask. Once this has been accomplished, that particular product molecule has been removed from the equilibrium and therefore is no longer affecting it. So we have essentially decreased its concentration in the boiling flask. This will encourage yet another set of molecules to react, forming the more volatile product, which will again make its way through the system and accumulate in the receiving flask. The process continues until we have depleted one or both of the reagents used in the synthesis. And at this point, as you can see, we have synthesized essentially a quantitative amount of the product, leaving the byproduct behind. So we've actually accomplished two things at once here. Not only have we maximized uh, the conversion of our reagents to the desired product, but we've also isolated the desired product from the byproduct of the reaction. And for this reason, distillation during synthesis is a very commonly used technique to exploit reversible reactions.